What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another weekly update. So there's tons of news to go over. I apologize, I didn't have a normal weekly update last week. I was at SEMA and uh, having a blast there. And I'll go over a few actual uh, new introductions from manufacturers that took place at SEMA, which was pretty cool. But first, uh, some non-SEMA stuff here. Uh, the first big story is the drive was sent some images of what looks like a Cadillac key fob for a mid-engine vehicle that's also a, can a convertible. And so um, this was sent into them by an anonymous uh, person and it looks pretty legit to me. Um, and you can clearly see there the silhouette of some type of sports car that has both the front, uh, you know, frunk area that's opening up there, a button for the rear hatch, and also a button to put down the convertible top, which is pretty sweet. Now, um, it's, all, you know, it's anyone's guess what this is. This does look like a legit key, so I'm inclined to believe this is a real thing. So it just, you know, it goes back to the, you know, the whole mid-engine Corvette thing. Is it actually going to be called a Corvette? Uh, from what I've heard, it sounds like it will actually be a Corvette. Maybe uh, the convertible version will be the Cadillac, because we haven't seen any convertible ones running around, at least that we know of, at least as far as a power top, like you see on that button. This could be a return of, you know, everyone saying the XLR Cadillac, which was also based on a Corvette, you know, a decade or so ago. So it could be something like that. Um, you know, we'll just have to wait and see, but very interesting that that has surfaced. Other Cadillac news here is the CT5 was spied, and uh, it has much less camo. It's still got some weird stuff on the back there to make it look like a Dodge Charger, even though it clearly isn't. I'm not sure who they think they're fooling. First off, you can kind of see the Escala-inspired looks, especially up front there. And uh, it's been it's been testing for a while, you know, looking very similar to this, but this is the first time we actually get a glimpse at the interior. And what we can see is that it's going to be pretty similar to the X-T4, which means they're ditching the capacitive touch buttons um, that everyone seemed to hate. I personally didn't mind them that much, but uh, everyone else hated them, so they got rid of it. And now you have conventional buttons, like you see in the X-T4 as well. And it uh, looks like an attractive interior, you know, a nice large touch screen and uh, you know some pretty simple gauges again we're probably looking at just a standard CTS here nothing sporty or anything um, and so that's cool to see uh, but also uh, another interesting thing with spied is a mule for what appears to be a V version of most likely this CT5 um, uh, although you know it's currently on a CTS V body that just looks like it's a little bit of a wide body setup we already know the CTSV is dying here after 2019, and so uh, you know this is almost certainly just a mule, which is why the wheel wells seem a little odd and stuff for the next gen version. You know, the XT or the CT5 will be replacing the CTS, and there will be a V version, it seems. And uh, the rumors are actually suggesting it'll keep the same 6.2 liter supercharged V8 engine here for the CT5V as well, which would be a very pleasant surprise. That would be amazing if that's the case. And it's also been rumored to be paired up with the new 10-speed automatic from the ZL1 that's also been could have with Ford and used in many applications like the Mustang. And uh, so that that awesome CTSV engine with a 10-speed auto behind it and give it even faster shifts would be fantastic, especially in an all-new vehicle there. Um, so we'll have to wait and see, but it sounds promising, you know, if they're already working on a development mule of one here. Uh, for some official reveals, uh, McLaren revealed the speed tail a couple, you know, about a week and a half ago here. And um, I think it looks fantastic personally other than the covered front wheels i know it's all for aero everything about this car is extremely aerodynamic um but the covers on the wheels just look a little odd to me uh but still very cool it's very elegant especially in the back there that tail it's 16.9 feet long total for the entire car and it has active aero of course in the back there though that um kind of discreetly hides the flaps so that you know there isn't a visible seam or anything it just kind of stretches a little bit i suppose and that's really cool. Uh, the whole body is made of carbon fiber as well, of course. And um, inside it has the same three seat setup as the McLaren F1 um, with the driver's seat in the middle, of course. There's other very cool features like uh, camera side mirrors that actually retract uh, whenever the car is in its velocity mode in order to make it even more aerodynamic. And there's airplane inspired driver controls mounted to the ceiling. Even like the uh, gear selector is on the ceiling, which is really, really cool. It also has electrochromatic glass uh, or electrochrome glass uh, for its windshield and that can darken with a touch of a button so there's actually no need for sun visors so they're not included uh, in this vehicle which is pretty wild stuff performance wise it has 1035 brake horsepower from a hybrid setup uh, combined with that twin turbo v8 engine and uh, the main headline here is the top speed of 250 miles per hour and uh, the most stunning thing is zero to 186 miles per hour
car only takes 12.8 seconds, um, which is insane considering it only took the P1 16 and a half seconds, uh, and that was already very, very quick. So going from 16 and a half to 12.8 is just bonkers. And that velocity mode that I mentioned earlier uh, lowers the car 1.4 inches to help with getting to that top speed, you know, for maximum uh, aerodynamic efficiency. Now they're only making 106 of these and they're all sold out at the low price of 1.75 million pounds, which with current conversion rates is around $2.24 million. And um, sadly, these aren't actually gonna be legal in the United States due to that three seat design and the lack of sufficient airbags. Uh, you know, our safety requirements, I think, you know, require side curtains and all the type of stuff which this vehicle doesn't have and um yeah so anyway um it's kind of a bummer but surprisingly they said one third of buyers are, are u.s buyers for these speed tails so that means they'll either keep them in europe or more likely they'll apply for what's called the show and display exemption uh, to bring it here to the states only have as a show vehicle not allowed to drive on the roads and um you know considering what most of these vehicles probably won't be driven anyway sadly and will just be collector's items and flipped for profit or just held and mothballed and stuff um you know i'm guessing most of the u.s owners are just holding it as an investment and that's it which is really really a shame um hopefully that some actually do drive these things but they're very rare and very expensive of nature i'm sure you will very very rarely see one of these on the road ever um, but amazing to know that it has all this uh, technical showcase here that mclaren has and hopefully this stuff will trickle down to other more attainable mclaren models in the future but anyway awesome to see that Aston Martin has shown three new images of its hypercar, the Valkyrie here, and still looks cool. And, uh, you know, they're just continuing to develop them. They said they're going to start deliveries by the end of next year, even though these prototypes uh, that they're planning to road test, they haven't even started road testing them yet. And that won't happen for several weeks still. And um, so, yeah, but anyway, cool to see they're still working on that. Aston Martin has also shown a special edition of the DBS Superleggera called the DBS 59. And so this pays homage to the first and second place finishes of the 1959 24-hour of Le Mans team that Aston Martin had there. And um, so they're all painted in British racing green, which uh, I'm partial to, of course, and love. And um, also has bronze and carbon fiber accents throughout the outside there and a brown leather interior, which looks pretty sharp to me as well. And they're only going to be making 24 of these. Uh, and... Uh, so that's pretty cool to see, but again, another very rare car you'll probably almost never see on the streets. Other DBS news is something you are actually likely to see on the streets is a Volante version of the DBS. So it was spy testing here. It looks very good, exactly how you would expect it to look. Uh, of course, it's just going to be the same exact thing as the current DBS Superleggera, just with a convertible soft top there. But the awesome thing about this is, you know, the current DB11 Volante is only available with a V8 for some reason, which is unfortunate because you can't hear that V12 with the roof off in these new ones. But with the DBS, DBS, DBS Volante, you will be able to do that, which is fantastic. So that's the way to get the V12 still with a convertible is to go for this whenever it's available, probably sometime next year. Speaking of convertibles, BMW has revealed the 8 Series convertible, uh, starting with this M850i xDrive, which looks very elegant, um, and uh, it should be because it costs $122,000. $395, which is $9,500 more expensive than the hardtop. That's a big jump for a convertible, $9,500. bucks. That's, that's just insane. But, it, you know, it still runs the same 523 horsepower twin turbo 4.4 uh, liter V8 engine, the 8-speed automatic they all get, and the X-Drive all-wheel drive system, which can put 100% of its torque to the rear wheels. And uh, 3.8 seconds, 0 to 60. I mean, these are supercar numbers, so very, very impressive, but still just, that's a steep upcharge, um, you know, for a convertible to me. Uh, but it does get some, a couple unique things here for the convertible outside of the top. Uh, it gets unique seats, which have neck warmers, similar to the Mercedes Air Scarf. That uh, This has three different speeds, and it even has an automatic mode that will change that fan speed automatically, depending on your uh, vehicle speed. You know, obviously, if you're going faster and it's a little colder, it'll uh, crank it up. And so that's pretty cool, but these are going to be available in March. So cool to see that. Other BMW news is that the 1 Series sedan was spied uh, testing some type of a refresh and these are already available in China and used to be China exclusive but now they're starting to be sold in Mexico as well and um, it's possible this could arrive there's been talks and rumors of it possibly coming to the states here to you know challenge the uh, you know new coming uh, A-Class from Mercedes and of course the current CLA and also the Audi A3 and stuff with their front wheel drive based platforms uh, this could fit in with with that as well I know you know BMW 
Cribs kind of stayed away from a small sedan, kind of left room for Mini instead. Um, but I could see this making a lot of sense here in the States, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, but anyway, there's lots of other European spy shots this week. Tons and tons of vehicles spied, lots of Mercedes actually. First off is the next gen C class was spied, which is a big surprise considering um, you know we just had the refresh of the C class, and it looks like this uh, all new C class here is only maybe a year out, maybe a little bit more, but uh, you know not much more than that. So um, I mean it's only got a camo wrap on. It does have unfinished headlamps and dummy taillights in the back there that you know obviously just uh, tacked on, not the real taillights. Um, but otherwise it looks like a pretty much final design. It looks very good, a little less boxy than the current C class, which is a welcome change a little more swoopier looking and sleeker and it's reported to be keeping the same four cylinder engines as before but we'll have next gen six cylinder engines available as well as a standard 48 volt mount hybrid system um, from other mercedes models that we've seen already it'll also be on the new platform that's shared with the e-class uh, that next gen platform for better ride comfort and all that type of stuff and it's also going to get a plug-in hybrid version much like the current c-class but we'll have much greater range is what's being reported here and so uh, that'll be great to help, uh, you know, step it up. And I'm sure there might be some kind of EQ version as well that's fully electric at some point down the road. Um, it's also, speaking of tech, supposed to get uh, more driver assistance tech here for this new C-Class, including a smartphone app that will allow it to have you pull it in and out of the garage uh, from the smartphone, like a Tesla, and also cruise control that adjusts automatically uh, the target speed automatically based on speed limits. So it'll automatically go up or down if it sees speed limits changing, um, which is uh, an interesting thing. Thing. And again, this is all just part of this report uh, by my spy photographer, Brian Williams. Um, it's also rumored to be getting a dual touchscreen setup, very similar to Audi's new setup you see in the A8 and A6. Um, but in this application for Mercedes, supposedly only the bottom screen would be touched, like the one for climate controls and stuff, and the upper screen would still not be touched, which doesn't seem to make much sense to me. Hopefully that's wrong. Um, but anyway, interesting to see that new C-Class. Also, the GLS from Mercedes was spied, and this one's rumored to be the Maybach version, although it's hard to really tell there isn't anything that gives it away as a Maybach version but uh, looks better uh, and gives us a better look at the lighting here on the GLS, which looks like it's going to get three LED sweeps, which is either a Maybach exclusive thing or it's just going to be a nice way to differentiate um, the different models within Mercedes because the new GLE has two sweeps. I'm pretty sure the GLC has one sweep from what we've seen in spy shots so far, and this has three, so that would kind of fit in with the hierarchy and would be a kind of a, a cool way to differentiate them, I think, so they don't all just blend together and look the same. Uh, and otherwise, you know, it looks very large. Uh, um, very appropriate for the largest SUV from uh, Mercedes here and it seems to be pretty reveal ready with you know production headlights and taillights and everything so hopefully we'll see a reveal of this relatively soon uh, but not sure when this is going to debut could be the LA Auto Show though you know in a few weeks here other Mercedes stuff that was spied a new 53 version of the Mercedes AMG T sports car uh, the actual two-door version I know it's confusing these days with the four-door sedan being called the same thing um, but the main giveaway for this new 53 version is the round quad exhaust which we know are from the 53 version, um, what you see on other 53 models within the Mercedes range. Um, and we do also know the four-door version of the MG GT also gets a 53 version already. Uh, and so this makes sense. And it's going to be using that three liter six cylinder um, with a regular turbo as well as an electric compressor to give it an output of 435 horsepower and 385 pound-feet of torque, most likely. Um, and it'll be the cheapest GT and make it a little more affordable whenever it debuts sometime next year. So cool to see that. The last Mercedes that was spied is the next-gen CLA uh, shooting brake, the wagon version of the CLA, which we unfortunately haven't got in the States here in the past and most likely will not get here in the States in the future either. But, you know, they're reporting it's going to share engines with the new A-Class, including the AMG versions, both the A35 and the A45 here for the CLA version. Um, but, yeah, hopefully we get this one in the States, but I'm not, definitely not holding my breath uh, since wagons just sadly do not sell here. A viewer from New Jersey also uh, spied what looks like the brand new Audi S7 spy running around without any camouflage really it was just running around but gives that you know clearly that new front bumper you see from we just saw on the R8 uh, a couple of weeks ago it was revealed and uh, looks very very good uh, you know just a little bit more aggressive right in line with what you expect from an S7 we know it's the S version not the RS version because you have um, the uh, quad exhaust tips that are around there you know we, of course the RS version has the large oval tips instead um, and looks very good there from just a couple of pictures 
and hopefully we see a full reveal soon. Another car that uh, was spied once again that we sadly won't be getting here in the States is the Next Gen Focus ST. We have some interesting developments here on the ST for those of you across the pond that uh, do get this. Um, it's going to have these promising looking uh, new Recaro seats, which are cool, a flat bottom steering wheel, and also this one is equipped with an automatic transmission, meaning that uh, this will most likely be offered with both a manual, of course, still and an automatic. It has a little rotary dial there for the transmission, much like you see in a Fusion or something, which is cool. I don't know what automatic transmission they would use with this. I don't know if the 10-speed would fit from, you know, other, you know, stuff like the Mustang or if it'll be, you know, some other transmission. Um, but anyway, very interesting to uh, see that. It's also been rumored to be switching uh, to the 1.5 liter turbo four cylinder that they're developing for Ford, uh, for Ford Europe, I suppose. And it's going to have supposedly up to 200, under, 275 horsepower, excuse me. And um, yeah, a 275 horsepower Focus ST that you can also get in an automatic um, would, uh, I think, would sell really well here still. It's really a bummer that Ford has decided to axe all these cars. Um, and so anyway, interesting to see that. In some other hot hatch news, Honda's awesome Type R that is available here is getting a few updates for 2019 as well. First off, a new color called Sonic Gray Pearl that looks pretty good. And the other uh, updates here are for the entire Civic range for 2019. I briefly touched on this in a previous weekly update, but we have actual pictures and details here on it now. Um, so they're all going to get a new revised infotainment system for 2019 and all these Civics that includes a volume knob and dedicated buttons for fan speed, which is welcome uh, changes there. Uh, but it's a bummer that it's still not the same head unit as the Accord. That one had a really cool head unit with, you know, uh, customizable tiles you can move around for the functions you use most frequently. And instead you have you know, basically the same setup as the current Civic, which is fine. It still works, you know, perfectly well, but uh, just not quite as nice as the one in the Accord to me. Also, they're saying Honda Sensing is going to be standard on all 2019 Civics as well. And prices have gone up slightly. It depends on the trim. You know, some are a little higher, some are a little lower. But for the Type R, uh, the price jump's going to be $1,000 more than last year. So now a Type R will run you $36,595. And um, yeah, hopefully the dealers also chill out on the markup so you can actually buy these at MSRP here pretty soon um, because the Type R is fantastic. So anyway, cool to see that. Toyota has teased TRD packages for both the Camry and the Avalon this past week. They're going to be showing at the Ali Auto Show here in uh, about a week or two. And um, so the looks, uh, it mo looks like it's mostly going to be consisting of this aero kit, wheels, and painted brake calipers. That's at least all we can see so far. But will most likely, in typical TRD fashion, be some suspension improvements, as well as a, probably an exhaust system tuned by TRD. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see you know, how that pans out. And uh, we do know that that the Super has been confirmed to be shown at the Detroit Auto Show in January. So that's when we'll see that. Um, and uh, I'll be in Detroit in January for that reveal. That'll be very exciting. Um, another vehicle, though, uh, that has been confirmed to be coming to the LA Auto Show here in a couple of weeks is the Jeep Scrambler truck. So we finally know we will be seeing it finally in LA um, in a couple of weeks. And so I'll be covering all that uh, whenever that comes out as well. Uh, speaking of trucks, though, there's lots of truck news this week. Uh, first is Volkswagen's Tarek. Um, was shown at the Sao Paulo uh, Motor Show in Brazil there. And it's a unibody truck uh, that has a folding cab wall, which is uh, pretty interesting there. It allows the bed to extend into the cabin. And um, so it's pretty creative use of space, but again, being unibody, you know, it's not gonna be quite as tough as a body on frame truck. Uh, but it's basically production ready, they're saying, and will be sold in the Brazilian market soon. Uh, but Motor Authority has confirmed from Volkswagen uh, that we will not be getting it in the United States. Absolutely not they said basically there's no chance but I have more about Volkswagen trucks here in a minute I'll be talking about because at the same auto show Ford uh, showed the Ranger Storm concept and it's basically an appearance package uh, but does have a functional snorkel there um, but otherwise it doesn't have the off-road suspension of the Raptor or anything like that um, and it uses a 3.2 liter uh, diesel five-cylinder uh, interesting engine I guess you know a Brazilian market thing of course and, and unfortunately this is only a concept um, but again even if it were made, it would only be for Brazil, most likely, or other parts of the world. Uh, Ford seems to be pretty adamant about not giving us any kind of performance version of the Ranger currently, unfortunately. Um, speaking of Volkswagen and Ford, though, nice little tie-in here. Uh, there's been lots of reports this past uh, week or two about the two company 
companies uh, talking about working together and partnerships and all that type of stuff. And um, one of those things they're talking about partnering up on is trucks. Uh, most uh, The primary thing is uh, Volkswagen CEO actually confirmed um, they're interested in using the Ranger for their own small truck, a successor to the Amarok, which uh, they said could also be available in the States since it'd be based on the U.S. Ranger, which again, the Ranger is sold all over the world as well. So that gives them a worldwide solution as well as a U.S. solution. But, uh, you know, if they just do a badge job on a Ranger, I don't know how many people are going to be wowed by that unless they really completely redo the interior and stuff as well. Because the Ranger interior uh, is just a carryover from the you know current Ranger, which has been sold elsewhere for many years already, and is the old Ford interior a little dated, honestly. And so, uh, yeah, we'll have to see. I mean, Volkswagen does do bad stuff like this every once in a while. They had the, the Volkswagen Ruton minivan, which was just a Dodge Caravan with Volkswagen uh, styling and badging and stuff. So this this is something they've been open to in the past. It could be something as simple as that, or it could be something a little more in-depth. We'll have to wait and see. Um, they're also um, talking about partnering up on uh, sharing EV development costs, since electric vehicles are very expensive to develop. Um, and they also are interested in Ford's autonomous tech. Uh, so maybe it'd be a little bit of a trade-off there. Maybe Ford gets some of the EV tech that uh, Volkswagen has been really pioneering and then Ford has been pioneering the autonomous stuff and Volkswagen can benefit from that. So we'll have to wait and see um, just how much they end up working together but it's interesting they're actually it's confirmed they're in talks and they're trying to make make a deal happen here so we'll have to stay tuned on that. Um, Chevy has shown a very aggressive Silverado ZH2 concept uh, this past week. It was developed by GM's defense division uh, and is uh, you know military contract stuff and it's similar to the Colorado Z H2 with uh, it using a hydrogen fuel cell for power with a range of more than 400 miles and the ability to generate two gallons of water per hour as its only emissions, which is awesome. It also has a dual tech battery system that can recharge in three minutes, which is pretty crazy. Um, styling uh, is pretty aggressive there and there's talk that it could be similar to what we're going to see on the next gen 2020 Silverado HD, the 2500 and up, you know, models there. But as far as this ZH2 and whether it even will be available to the military, that remains to be seen if this will actually be put into production. Um, but very cool that GM's developing this stuff. And uh, speaking of Silverado production, though, an interesting thing Chevy announced this past week is that the current gen Silverado and the GMC Sierra of the current generation will be uh, built alongside the new ones and available for sale uh, through uh, the end of 2019 here, depending on demand. And so uh, it'll be uh, called, uh, I think they said the Silverado LD and uh, basically just you know for those who don't like the styling of the new Silverado or Sierra uh, you can go to uh, the old ones still. Although personally, you know, I thought the Silverado styling was a little crazy when I first saw it earlier this year, but now I don't think it's so bad. And especially the GMC, the new next gen Sierra looks really good to me, honestly. And so uh, we'll have to see. But anyway, cool to see they're giving people the choice at least. Um, Ram has also been spy testing their uh, 2500, uh, you know, heavy duty truck, the 2020 version here, uh, with only just a little bit of camo. But they <laughs> clearly have shown us the headlights and taillights. Uh, without even trying to hide those aspects. And so you can see the headlights there are unique and have a little turn signal portion underneath uh, the headlamps. And also you can see the grill is pretty tall, much taller than a normal 1500 Ram. And so, uh, you know, that'll obviously be all part of that whole packaging for the 2500 version. Otherwise, you know, it does look fairly similar. We also have heard it's going to get a very, very identical interior, it seems, to the regular Ram 1500, which is a good thing because the Ram has the nicest interior hands down in a truck currently. So so, uh, you know, that's a fantastic idea in my opinion. And so cool to see that spied running around. Now for uh, the stories from SEMA though, there's only a few that I'm going to talk about because there's been, there was so much custom stuff. There's no way to cover it and it's not really relevant. Honestly, a lot of it's cookie cutter stuff and the stuff that is unique uh, is just one-off builds, which is cool, but not really what I cover on this channel. So I'm going to stick to the OEM manufacturer stuff. And there were a few cool debuts from them though. Uh, first off, Mopar revealed the thousand horsepower elephant crate engine um, and that number actually comes uh, from 93 octane that thousand horsepower so there's potential for even more if you run race gas which is just bonkers so this motor here is a 426 cubic inch which is seven liters uh, version of the current hemi um, but it's obviously been uh, upgraded and stuff and also has a three liter supercharger on top of it which is 0.3 bigger than even the supercharger on the demon which is already 0.3 uh, larger than the uh, hellcat so 
a huge supercharger there on this motor, uh, but it still redlines at 7,000 RPM, so it's still a high revving engine for you know an engine this large. It's really impressive. Um, the kit's going to be available in the first quarter of next year. Um, but the unfortunate thing is you can only put it on uh, pre-1976 vehicles or on off-road vehicles. It's not road legal with this engine, unfortunately, unless, again, it's from 1976 or earlier, which is a bit of a bummer. You can't drop it into a new Hellcat or anything like that. But maybe this is a, a hint at what's to come down the road, maybe someday in the future in a next-gen Hellcat or something like that. We'll have to see how that all pans out. Um, but the price wasn't given for this Hellfent crate engine, but we do know the Hellcat crate engine is already $19,350 before all the extra stuff, the wiring harnesses and everything you have to add on to it. Um, so if that's almost twenty grand already before all the extra stuff, basically if you want this Hellfent motor, you're probably looking at at least twenty-five, I'm guessing, plus all the stuff on top of it. You're, it's at least 30 grand just for the whole setup, I'm sure. Probably more. Um, but anyway, uh, they also showed uh, this supercharger, they called it. Uh, sweet, it is a, a wide body 1968 charger, um, which has a lot of cool uh, stuff you know, built into it there. To, and also, of course, to show off that Hellfin engine. But it even had like the taillights in the back there were also built into the exhaust tip. So uh, that's all one thing, which is pretty sweet. And all kinds of other little cool details like you see on uh, custom vehicles. Uh, but anyway, it was really awesome to see in person. And it also sounded fantastic, that Hellfent motor. They started up for us. I was there. Yeah. Woo. Woo. And Chevy did almost the exact opposite thing at SEMA by uh, showing off this new e Copo Camaro, which is very cool in its own way, though. So this is just a prototype and not for sale. Um, but this is a fully functioning electric drag racing vehicle, which is crazy. Um, it uses an 800 volt battery pack along with electric motors on the rear wheels for over 700 horsepower, they say, and uh, 600 pound feet of torque and an estimated nine second quarter mile time, which is really, really fast and very impressive. But the most interesting thing about this to me and to many others is they designed it so that it bolts right up to any GM automatic transmission. Obviously, it'd have to be beefed up for the power if it can't handle it already. But uh, this basically means it's a drop-in kit. So they're saying it's not obviously not ready yet for public consumption, but whenever it is, you know, they're saying this could be uh, some type of future crate engine, so to speak, of you know just dropping in this electric power plant right in the engine bay, and you're good to go, and you can convert any vehicle to EV basically. You know, if it's a GM uh, product with an automatic transmission, which is pretty crazy and mind-blowing. Uh, Ford uh, also showed the GT Carbon Series supercar here, uh, which is the lightest version yet uh, for the GT. And so it has an exposed carbon fiber stripe, side mirrors, optional car the optional carbon fiber wheels are now standard as part of the package, and many other carbon fiber bits all around the vehicle, as well as that titanium exhaust system to help lower that weight as well. So that means it loses 39 pounds over a regular Ford GT. And uh, again, not huge savings, but still you know substantial, especially if you are planning to race these um, and anyway cool to see them show that at SEMA Nissan has shown one of my favorite cars here at SEMA was an interesting 370Z um, they're calling Project Club Sport 23 and this basically is them listening to fans and doing what everyone expected them to do um, because they dropped the Infiniti 3 liter uh, twin turbo V6 engine in uh, from the Q60 Red Sport with its 400 horsepower dropped that into the 370Z paired it up with a manual transmission which is the first time that motor has been paired with a manual in the Infiniti it's automatic only of course um, and and uh, it seems like it fits perfectly and looks ready to go. There's It's a running driving vehicle and um, shows that maybe this isn't so hard for Nissan to do. At least, you know, if they want to even use this basis from the 370Z and just update the looks in the interior, put this new motor in it, and boom, you have a 400Z right there. Um, that would be pretty cool. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, there's some other like, other cool touches here on the vehicle as well, such as exhaust that were cut into the rear bumper there right by the license plate area. Kia has shown the 2020 Forte GT at SEMA, and this is a full-on production vehicle. They just uh, wanted to show off at SEMA, and they even showed a customized lime green version as well. Um, but anyway, you know, think of this. This used to be like the SX trim for the Forte, um, and uh, that's I reviewed an SX Forte last year. It has the same engine, um, but they've now rebranded it as 
a GT here for this all new Forte, you know, the next gen version here. But it still uses that 1.6 liter turbo four cylinder engine um, that it's had for a while and shared with Hyundai. So it does 201 horsepower and 195 pound feet of torque still. It's offered with a manual still, or you can get the seven speed dual clutch auto, but awesome to see they're continuing to offer the manual there. And it's got lots of uh, nice and uh, nice additions here though for the GT trim. Uh, there's a sport tuned dual exhaust. Uh, the torsion beam rear suspension has been thrown out and replaced with an independent rear suspension and you know, fully independent. Um, there's also thicker sway bars, larger brakes. You can give, even get uh, Michelin Pilot uh, Sport 4 tires on it as an option. That's an additional option, they said. But that's awesome. You can get you know really good tires right from the factory there. The styling also gets a little more sporty with a different grill. You can see it has the interesting uh, little red dots there throughout it. Uh, there's also gloss black uh, accenting all around the vehicle in various areas, a little spoiler and stuff like that. Uh, it also gets unique wheels. And uh, inside there's sports seats with contrast stitching, a flat bottom steering wheel, and aluminum pedals. And they're going to be uh, tiering these kind of like the same way they have the different tiers for this Stinger. So there's going to be a GT one package and a GT2 package for the options and um, you know that top one gives you the extra driver assistance tech a Harman Kardon stereo and heated and cooled seats and um, there's also going to be a GT line appearance package for the regular Forte as well with the slower engine and the CVT if you just want the cool looks uh, and don't want the performance um, but anyway this is going to be available sometime next year they just said it's the 2020 model but they didn't actually announce a release date but anyway cool to see that Tesla has rolled out Navigate on Autopilot as a new feature last week. And so this allows the car to automatically merge, change lanes, take off ramps, uh, all with the driver's permission currently. But they said later on, future iterations, that you won't need to have the driver's permission. It'll just do its own thing um, once it gets a little more, uh, I guess, a little more refined at doing all these tasks. Uh, I guess some journalists did actually uh, test this out um, on some type of press drive that Tesla had. And it uh, wasn't perfect still. It's still in the learning stages and it's amazing Tesla just basically uses people to beta test this stuff and um, yeah so but as it gets better they're going to again you know kind of uh, in the meantime force drivers to pay a little more attention until this stuff gets better and then they'll allow the computer to take over a little bit more but anyway that's only going to be available on cars with the enhanced autopilot if you've got the basic autopilot system uh, then you don't have that feature you have to have those extra cameras and sensors in order to do this um, the last uh, story this week here is a new report about Hyundai working on a Halo model for the N brand. And uh, we've heard a lot about this in the past couple of years, honestly, it's been at this point. Um, there's been lots of talk, you know, with uh, those mid-engine concepts, the RM15 and the RM16, which is the one pictured there. Um, and recently, the N vice president, uh, Thomas Shimera, uh, told Auto REI, think of the RM16 and you have a bit of an idea of what is possible, which sounds really vague, but thankfully he went on with a little more uh, specifics here and said, this is going to be a great machine, something nobody expects from Hyundai, something really exotic. It will be a car in the super sports segment. So that sounds very promising. Uh, we'll have to wait and see, you know, uh, what they end up doing. You know, we did see that Hyundai concept that was shown at the New York Auto Show a few months ago. Maybe it's something like that, although that was a Genesis branded vehicle. So I don't know if they're going to want to keep this as a Hyundai thing and just make some type of mid-engine Veloster after all, or what they're going to do. Uh, maybe Genesis gets their own Halo model. You know, I will have to see what they end up having planned. But anyway, interesting to hear they're probably working on something. So cool to see that. But yeah, so that's it for all the news this week, guys. So thank you guys very much for watching. Let me know your thoughts and everything in the comments below. And I'll see you guys next week. Take care.